Some of you out there know Andy Ott, but most of you don't. And truthfully, that's the way Andy prefers it because for 21 years now, Andy has been working quietly behind the scenes, providing technical direction at Radius Church and making sure our Sundays go off without a hitch. So tech guys are like long snappers in football. You only notice them whenever something goes wrong. So the long snapper can snap the ball 99 times out of 100 just right to the punter. But whenever he snaps the ball over the punter's head that one time, everybody wants to know who the long snapper is because they want to know who messed up. And that's kind of how life is in the tech world. Whenever a mic goes out, uh, whenever a screen starts to glitch, the heads in the congregation start to spin around trying to figure out what went wrong. So Andy would prefer not to be seen most of the time. But uh, in my professional opinion, I can tell you this, Andy is the best tech guy in the biz uh, because whenever COVID hit, um, uh, churches across the, the nation are scrambling, but we didn't sweat it because Andy had a plan. And whenever we plant churches, Andy knows exactly what we need, who needs to run it, how do we train them. Uh, he's got us ready to go. So Andy, we've known each other now for two decades and I know you would prefer to be directing the spotlight rather than be the one in the spotlight. But today, as we celebrate your 1000th Sunday at Radius Church, I just wanna say good job, my man. Thanks for working so hard. We see you. If all Andy Ott ever did was fix the stuff that I screwed up, it'd be a full-time job. Thanks, Andy. Andy, there's no way we'd be here without you, man. Uh, your wisdom and insight and specific skill set um, blesses us all, man. Here's to a thousand more Sundays. Love you, man. I just wanted to say thanks for all you do. You do so much that nobody knows about. Like little things like running the generator out to our house in the middle of a hurricane. That meant the world to me and my family. Once again, just thank you, man. you got the great heart. Nobody hardly ever gets to know that, but you're a great dude, and I appreciate everything you do. Hey, Andy. Just wanted to say thanks for all you do. Um, a lot of our events, I know I put a lot of a lot of last minute heat on you, but you have never buckled. It's incredible, uh, but really do appreciate you. Thankful for you, man. Hey Andy, this is JP. Listen, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everything that you do, the passion, the commitment that you bring to the AV and to Radius. Thank you, appreciate you, and uh, White Knoll loves you. Man, 1,000 Sundays? Congratulations, Andy. Hey, I know you act stressed out, but deep down, you love it and you live for this stuff. Man, thank you. You know we couldn't do this without you. Congratulations. Oh, hey, Andy. Just doing like you taught me, winding up the cord right over the elbow. Just kidding, man. Seriously, thank you for all that you do. There's no way we could do everything that we do without you. Thank you. Great to be with y'all this Sunday morning. We do this 10 times a year where we all hear the same sermon the same way at all eight of our locations. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. We like it. We like the rhythm it gives our campus pastors. It kind of gives them a week to lead in other ways. It uh, gives us a chance to hold us together as, as one church in some ways. And so we've been doing this for a while. So welcome. This, this is how it'll go today. How about 1,000 Sundays for Andy Ott. Andy was here at the very beginning of Radius, so that was 21 years ago. I remember him walking the door. He looked 12 years old. He had a, a brand new wife, and man, within a week, Lanny was singing, and Andy was running the sound, and he's been running it ever since. So a good third of those 1,000 Sundays, man, he did all of that just volunteering because he believed in church planting, and he loved Jesus, and he loved us. He probably had another third that he was underpaid, so we're thankful for that third as well. And then this last third, he's really carried us in a season where, man, technology has meant more and more to us. Some of you guys that were here as we walked through COVID, Andy carried us through COVID. By uh, He was just ahead of the curve on technology and put us in some places that we wouldn't have been able to be had we not had him on this team. So we're really, we're really thankful for him. If you see him, uh, thank him. Thank him for serving us. Let him represent our staff, though. We have lots of folks like Andy that are unseen, that uh, serve behind uh, the scenes. And, man, 
they are a great bunch. They complete our staff in ways that it's kind of hard to explain, but the quality of men and women in those roles is great. So thank the person that helped uh, train and teach your child this morning back in the children's area. Uh, the person that served you coffee. There's a variety of folks on our staff, and, and whether paid or unpaid, that serve because they love Jesus, they believe in the church, and they love the town that your campus is in. If you speak to Andy and he's at your campus in the next couple months, if he's there, he's probably fixing something. Ask him about the time when he moved houses because he wanted to be closer to the action. We named our church Radius in the early days, and he really felt, he and Lanny, after a prayer meeting, he thought they needed to move closer to where it was all happening to live up to that value of being near his radius. Ask him about that because that's a faith story for his family, and it's our faith story. It's a core to who radius is. Somebody ought to ask him about the first laptop that we ever owned. He actually had the AV guys that were all volunteering, including himself, uh, pool their money so that we could actually get this one laptop, one uh, Apple laptop that we were so proud of. It's just cool stories back from the early days where we had a little team of folks trying to establish one church in Lexington. And because of the work of those men and women, and particularly Andy and Lanny, oh, we're really thankful to be here today. Uh, we as a staff want to thank you as you uh, give here at Radius uh, and, and now we can actually, uh, a, a lot of us didn't get paid for a while. We actually get paid to give our time to serve. Just like Andy, we want all of our staff to be, as they count that, we're, we're thankful for it, but we'd also do without. So uh, right now, we just want to thank you for making that possible for us. Let me pray and we'll jump into this text this morning. Just want to get this right, Lord. Read this story for weeks now, and I know it's important this morning. And I know you could speak to people in a variety of ways from it. So would you please just speak? Give me some words, but would you speak despite my words? And by your power, Holy Spirit, get to the core of who we are and encourage where necessary Confront where necessary. Bring deep conviction where necessary, Lord. You, you do work in our rooms this morning. We trust you with it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you know, if you've been here for a little bit, we've been working our way through the book of Acts. It's the fifth book in the New Testament, and um, it, it's, it's been good. It's been good for the church. We're calling the series Let's Go because... From the very beginning of that book to where we are today, uh, we see the church moving, the followers of Jesus moving toward other people. It starts really right out of the gate in Acts chapter 2, and uh, we move all the way, and we've been following this one character, if you've been with us for a while, his name's Paul, and he goes on these missionary journeys, and he goes from town to town sharing the good news about Jesus. He would go to synagogue first, which was a place where the Jewish folks would gather to worship and look at God's word. And he would present the good news about a, the Messiah who was come. And some would believe. And then eventually those folks, he would teach about Jesus and they would form a little nucleus of a church. And there'd be a church in that town. It's been cool to watch him. Uh, we're in chapter 18 today. It's his second, second missionary journey. And I thought today we would just focus on on one little small part of the team that was planting churches with Paul. Sometimes uh, we don't do a great job of, of that in church life. We'll talk too much about the pastor and not talk enough about the team. Sometimes we'll talk too much about the pastor and the team and not talk about Jesus enough. And so hopefully we'll never do that. Hopefully we'll always talk about Jesus foremost but today as we read this passage, I want you to just be introduced to part of the team that established churches across the world as we read the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 18. Then Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. So he's going from a town that has, um, man, serious horsepower in Athens uh, when it comes to intellect and philosophy. They like to talk a lot. They're working things out. And he goes 50 miles to this other town called Corinth. In our, in our culture, it'd kind of like be going from the Raleigh-Durham area where you got Duke and UNC and a lot of intellectual horsepower, and you go to Myrtle Beach where 
there's a lot of movement, right? Like, so at the intellectual level, they're discussing how to live. And in Corinth, Myrtle Beach, they're living in a variety of really unhealthy ways. I would imagine Corinth, uh, as I've read, folks are coming through the town very regularly. And there's all sorts of uh, really unhealthy things going on in that town. So he moves in. And there in Corinth, he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently arrived in Italy with his wife, Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. And Paul lived and worked with them, and they were tent makers just as he was. So we get introduced to part of his team. If you're uh, single here today, this is the only really couple that is mentioned by name in the whole New Testament. So as we go through learning a little bit about this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, man, don't feel left out. I I don't know if you remember just a few weeks ago, we talked about Lydia, a key lady who's probably a widow, so a single lady, who became the centerpiece for the church in Philippi, her town. Uh, Paul himself seems to be a widowed man. You had to be married to be a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He must have lost his wife at some point. And so he's a single guy really getting it done. Peter, we know, has a wife, but she's not named. And so he seems to be the primary face of what he did. Timothy's a young man, probably a single young man as we read it. There's this great variety of folks with this amazing news about God coming to earth and becoming man in the form of Jesus, living a life, uh, eventually being, dying on the cross because of our sins, being buried, and then this crazy news that he rose from the grave and he defeated death. And so as they go town to town sharing this good news, all sorts of diverse groups of people believe. You got all sorts of ethnic groups believe. You got uh, certainly men and women playing a major role in spreading this news across uh, the world of, of that time. And in this particular case, it's a couple. It's a, a, a married couple, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Aquila is a Jewish guy. He comes from, from Pontius. A lot of folks uh, actually propose that he may have heard the gospel for the first time in Jerusalem and believed in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. We don't know that. People like to propose these things. Uh, he, he evidently meets Priscilla in Rome at some point. Uh, my in-laws are from Kansas and Nebraska, and they met in Alaska. You know, you know how, how these things work. That Priscilla and Aquila fell in love in Rome. A lot of people propose that Priscilla came from a middle, upper-class family in Rome, so had some resources, and these two are married. And then um, all of a sudden, they're ejected from Rome because Aquila is a Jew. So for racial reasons... They're thrown out of Rome and they're deported to this town called Corinth and they have to set up and get started with life in, in a totally new town. Very likely had to leave Priscilla's family who would have been Roman and could stay. And now here she is with her husband and they're in this new town because of his race. It's a really interesting, difficult start. So if I, if I could, I'd like to take Priscilla and Aquila and address the couples at our church and, and just challenge us with their lives. It should challenge us all. Um, We've seen all sorts of examples of single life as well in Acts. But these two, uh, they build a home together, and we're going to get to watch them build a home, a home bigger than brick and mortar, a home, their relationship. We don't know if they had kids or not, but their relationship, their family, and even the house in which they lived in, they build a home. I want us to just look at that for a little bit. They're also going to build people. As we read the text, you'll see them build people together. They have this chemistry with one another that they, they're able to give away to others. And, and in the end, they're, gonna, they're literally going to build churches. I'm not talking about steeples and stuff like that. I'm talking about a group of people that rally in a town that become a church. So let's just look at those first three verses. In order to build a home, let me just give you four or five, I don't know, keys to building a home, if you would. So if you're a young couple, uh, man, you may want to take a few notes. <laughs> Number one, you can't be a whiner. <laughs> Good homes, healthy homes, strong homes aren't built on whiners. This young couple is ejected out of 
Rome and they land in this new place and it would have been really easy for them just to become whiners and talk about how they were wronged. It's just really difficult to go anywhere and do anything when you're always talking about how you were wronged. There's some in our rooms that have been wronged in ways that uh, are unimaginable. And there's certainly times where those pains need to be worked through, um, either with somebody that's older and godly that can walk you through it or maybe even counseling. So some of those wrongs are deep and intense. And others of them are just part of life. And um, we have to work our way through them and, and keep moving in, in some sort of way. I, I, as I have lived for a little while now, you meet folks that they just whine about everything. They whine about their boss. That's the number one target. They not whine about their kids, teachers, or coaches. Uh, they whine about uh, they whine about the pastor or the church or the churches in town or like it's just or the coach of their college football team. Like this, just this constant or the politicians. Oh man, it's gonna be crazy in just a couple of days. Man, don't let that election screw up your family because you. I mean, it, it might have some pain to it. I don't know which way it's gonna do. Don't let it knock us off kilter. We got too much to do. Man, when we become whiners, it just puts this negative vibe in our home that's unhealthy, it curses it in some ways. So fight against it. Let me just say this. If you whine about more than one of those things regularly, you're the problem, right? You're the common denominator. If you whine about all those things, very likely you're the problem. And it's a good moment this morning to look in the mirror and go, man, Lord, I'm sorry, there's this arrogance in me that makes me uh, want to fix everybody else, and I just got so much work to do inside. Would you meet me this morning and help me get over that? He'll be faithful to. He might do it in ways unanticipated. But in order to build a good home, particularly a marriage between Priscilla and Aquila, they had to get up and go to the next town and get started. And what do they do? They go to work. They're tent makers. In those days, people traveled all over the world, so tents was a ma major commodity. I imagine them being fairly successful business people and knowing what they're doing. And um, they start this little tent-making business. Paul moves to town and makes tents with them. He comes from a place in the world that was known for making tents. So they start the job, and they start working it together. I, I kind of picture Aquila, the husband, Casting a vision for what this business is going to work like, look like, and then he and his wife are able to work together. Every husband and wife can't work together, but they can, and they build this business, and it's got beauty to it and, 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 and profitability to it. But they do more than that because you do that kind of shoulder to shoulder. Husbands and wives in our rooms, a lot of us work shoulder to shoulder and get stuff done. We parent together. We do all those things. But they must have, as you read the text, they must have also looked face to face a significant amount of time because their chemistry and togetherness is rich or it wouldn't endure the things that they're going to walk through in a lifetime. I'm going to remind myself and remind you, it's really easy to get running along and serving with your husband and wife shoulder to shoulder and just neglect the time to look each other in the face. And, and uh, it can be romantic or it can just be a, a little more restful over a meal where it's just the two of us. Man, don't let travel ball steal the soul of your marriage. We do way too much counseling here where some random hobby has broken up a marriage and cursed the family uh, for something that, man, <laughs> I remember uh, when my oldest boy was playing travel ball, we're on a trip and we're playing I'm sitting in the stands, and this dad leans over to me, and he goes, hey, these kids right here, they're going to be the high school baseball team. It was like this moment, of uh, this epiphany where I looked at him. My kid's playing right field. I was like, he's a good little athlete. Yeah, I, I thought he could play ball, but I'm looking around like, ain't no way these kids are going to play high school baseball. It turned out, shoot, I think one of them did. And all of that time and energy, which we, we just regulated. We weren't willing to spend it because we weren't going to lose. We weren't going to lose our home for something as trivial as that. So you regulate it, figure it out, whether it's travel ball or whether it's uh, something else that's your job. In order to build a home, th there's got to be tension on those things where there's, there's this intentional focus of being face-to-face -face enough where that marriage is healthy. 
This marriage in particular seems hungry for the truth. They literally invite truth into their house. They move Paul into their house. They share a business with Paul. And for 18 months, according to how this passage reads, they're going to hear the truth from Paul, both in the synagogue and in their home. And, and after his time sharing the, sharing the truth in the town over and over, they're going to hear from him. And you just imagine it developing their core as a marriage that, man, would endure the test of time. I would encourage every couple, and it doesn't matter whether you're married or not, what if you took the next 18 months and you intentionally exposed yourselves to good teaching of the Bible over the course of that time? You can go back through our, we got, we got a lot of sermons online, you can go back through them. We're not the best in the world, but you, you could get, well, we try to do a good job with the Word, and the Word will change you if you hear it over and over. These days, you literally can go listen to the best in the world. Explain the scripture. If you need a couple key resources, ask us and we'll give them to you. The word over time as you're hearing it from others, and particularly if you can process it in community with others, it'll change you. For some of you, like, well, I don't know where your marriage is. I can guarantee that will transform uh, it from where it is to where it could be. As a single young guy, I had this uh, teacher that I really admired. Uh, his name was Keith Leverance. And I can remember, I wanted to know everything he knew. I was pretty naive. I didn't know much about life. But I remember going to the ATM. I got $200. That's all I had. I think I had like $213. I got $200. And I went in and put it on his desk. And I said, I want to learn everything you know, as if $200 would cover that. He was kind and gracious. And he kind of pushed the $200 back to me. But he gave me, he gave me an hour a week for years and more. He invited me in his home, and Betty would feed me and a friend, and we would go through some sort of study. I'm telling you, my kids have been blessed by that. This church has been blessed by that. That season where he gave to me was crucial to my development, but it started with me being hungry and going to get it. I need to tell you, like, those of y'all in your teens or 20s or even 30s at our church that you're trying to figure out life, there's somebody in our room, they need somebody to invest in. Knock on their door. Offer to pray for Waffle House. Get in front of them. It'll, it'll change your future. So they weren't whiners. They worked hard. They were hungry for the truth enough to invite it into their home. And then as they matured, they shared their home. <laughs> They, they built a home, but they shared it. Paul lives with them. Let me read you this real quick. This is in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to the Corinthians um, about from, from a different place. He said, the churches here in the province of Asia send greetings. That would be the church of Ephesus, most likely. Greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla. They've moved, and they're writing back to their friends in Corinth and all the others who gather in their home for the church meeting. So they're sharing their home. Paul lives with them in Corinth. They moved to Ephesus and the church meets in their home. Later, they're going to move back to Rome and the church is going to meet in their home. They're building this home. It's healthy. They're literally going to build a structure in Ephesus and in Corinth. They're trying to figure out how many parking spots can we get in this house so that we can have a church in here. They're going to build it not just for their needs, but for others. They're putting a spare bedroom on, on the house. So Paul, when he comes and visits he can, he can have room. It's, it's, they keep it clean so that when somebody new comes in town, they can have them. Hey, that's what we're supposed to be doing with our houses. It's supposed to be a place of hospitality. It's supposed to be a place where we live, but where others are welcome. And in their case, they would even, even host the church in their times. For us, building our home literally means picking the right neighborhood. So when we evaluate a home, we want to make sure there's enough parking because we want to have a lot of people at our house. But we also want to land in a neighborhood where we can impact the most people. And, and we've learned through the years, this is what happens when you move a little bit. The, the best neighborhoods for us are around 50 homes. Cheryl's, you know, 10 extrovert, so she wants to know everybody. When it's more than 50, it kind of overwhelms her. When, it's, uh, when we're out anywhere alone, she doesn't have enough activity. And so like a neighborhood of about 50, which is where we live now, she can know everybody and she's got activity going on in the neighborhood and it's, just, it's good ministry. That's what our homes are about as followers of Jesus. So I think it's pretty cool on that note to read this next verse. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that and then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Chetria where there's a barbershop, evidently he gets a haircut. That's a long story I don't have time for. And he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. So he's go they're going to 
leave their home in Corinth, which has been good to them, where they've got a good business going, and they're going to move to Ephesus because Paul's going, and they feel called, if you will, to follow him, to go that way. But what's really interesting about this verse is that the writer says Priscilla's name first and Aquila's name second, which is highly irregular for those days. As a matter of fact, Priscilla and Aquila are going to be mentioned six times in the Bible, and four of the six, Priscilla's name's coming first. Why? Well, man, if you go to my neighborhood right now and you ask about the Reeves family, they're going to say, you mean Cheryl and John? They're going to say Cheryl's name first because Cheryl has the most influence in the neighborhood. Now, they know me. I'm with Cheryl, so they're not just going to say just Cheryl Reeves. They're going to say Cheryl and John. Cheryl delivers cinnamon buns. She takes banana bread around. She talks to everybody when she walks. Occasionally, if a tree falls, I get the call, and I can put on steel toe boots and take my chainsaw down and, and get some work done. For the most part, Cheryl knows the neighborhood, and I'm with her in it because I love the way she loves the neighborhood. Now, Radius, you probably say, like if you ask about the Reeves family, you say uh, John and Cheryl. And you'd say my name first because people, I, I have more influence here. Cheryl's with me, as you guys, some of you know her well. Like, she's with me. We're together in this. When I'm done with this sermon, she's going to give me feedback whether I want it or not. We're together in it. You really feel that in this passage that Priscilla and Aquila, they're together, that it's healthy. And for the dudes in the room, when you read that, you ought, I, I just picture Priscilla flourishing. Like she is using inside the church, in her home, and in the business, she's using her gifts. And Aquila's making a way for that. So much so that when they're named, the, the towns where they've, where they've helped lead churches, folks know Priscilla even better than Aquila. And I don't see that as unhealthy. I see that as incredibly healthy. We've got that at our church. We've got uh, some single ladies that lead. We've got some married ladies that, that lead at our church. Andrea Crick actually sits on our executive team, and she leads uh, on our executive team. And she does some stuff from a leadership standpoint. I'm going to tell you, the three dudes on that same team, there's four of us on it, the three, we just can't do like she does. She brings femininity into that leadership role in a way that is wonderful for our church, and you benefit from it. The same thing's happening at your campus. We've got ladies throughout our history of 21 years until the day that have helped build this place. Some of them married, some of them not. Let me just say to the married couples, when our eyes are on the mission and then even more so on who uh, puts us, commissions us into the mission, Jesus, then all of a sudden that, that marriage just becomes a, a great instrument in the Lord's hand to bring uh, health to his mission. So thank you. Some of y'all been doing that for 21 years here at Radius. Some of you for 10. Some of you just getting in. Some of you have done it as single folks. Thank you. And ladies particularly, as I read this passage, I just, I, it just really brings to mind the work that you're doing. In the early days of Radius, we had this heavy emphasis on pushing the dudes. We don't apologize for that at all. As a matter of fact, we're thankful for it, proud of it. We needed to do it. As a nation, men have kind of disappeared from the church. And as a matter of fact, some people would come to our church. They used to make some of our friends would make fun of us. They call it man church because we were so hard on the dudes in our preaching and how we operated. We're going to continue to press, press guys. I feel like, though, in the last few years, we've really grown uh, in some ways where to practice what we believe, that men and women were created absolutely equal but different. And when we go back to Genesis and we evaluate how God made women, men and women in Genesis to cultivate the earth together, that they're, they complete one another both in marriage and, uh, and also in the church who really can't get it done without the other. There's this, uh, we use the word complementary complementarian or this, this relationship between men and women working together that by God's design glorifies Jesus and gets his work done on this earth. By the way, if you're going to use the word complementarian, understand how it's spelled. I'm not going to spell it for you, but it's not spelled like compliment. It's more like uh, complement. Not exactly, but more like complete. It's about making complete not like complimenting somebody, saying something nice about them. I like your shirt. It's completing somebody, like bringing it to perfection. So the church, man, we need men and women. And what's really cool in Acts, there's this liberty for ladies to do stuff, and they become major players in the church throughout history. 
that, uh, man, has benefited all of us. We're complementarian, so we would say there's a couple roles at the church based on our reading of the scripture. We're not angry about being hit, but we, we really believe that the elder role is reserved for men. And then this role, teaching the whole, teaching the body is reserved for men. You want to talk about that? Ask your campus pastor. I'm sure he can answer. No, we'd love to talk about it. Uh, but the mission really was driving this couple. And you can see them thriving with the mission in front of them as they travel the world, really. They moved to Ephesus with, uh, with Paul. And if, if you know the story well, they, they basically land. Paul shares the gospel with a few people in Ephesus. And then he rolls and leaves them there. That means that, that marriage is sturdy. <laughs> to quote Anthony Ray from downtown at Southside, they're sturdy. This couple's together. They're sturdy. Paul drops them in, and he rolls, and they really take the few people that he's rallied, that he's led to the Lord, and they establish a church, and they establish it in their home. Verse 24, they're out and about as a couple. They've built this home, and now they're going to build people. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, verse 24, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria is a place where he was probably trained. Alexandria is another place with, uh, where philosophy and education and all those things were held high. So he, mu he must have been a pretty elite thinker. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he had, he had taught others about Jesus with enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. He only knew about this baptism of repentance. He hadn't heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and beyond. And when Priscilla, again Priscilla's name first, and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. It's a really kind of cool moment where this couple who's establishing a church and all you guys have been on a ride planting one of our campuses, you know how this works. They're out and about meeting folks and and loving their radius, if you will. They're at the synagogue. They're hearing folks process the word. And here comes this guy, Apollos, and he's electric as he communicates. But, uh, man, he's missing part of the truth. So they do a couple things. If you're going to build people, you're going to want to do some of these things. You can do this as a single man or woman. You can do it as a couple. Couples, you do it. Uh, you could do it a lot like these guys did. Uh, first of all, they're on the hunt. They got their head up, and they're looking. They're looking for somebody to give to what they have. So when they see Apollos, they're responding. Again, for those of you in the room, you've been married for 20 years. You've been following Jesus for 20 years. But we need you to have your head up this morning in this room. There's people in this room that need love and they need leadership. We've got that happening. We've had that happen throughout our history. It's got to continue to happen. It's, it's the hope of the Midlands that folks that have known Jesus for a while would give that away to somebody else. But you've got to have your head up to see it. Um, in order to hunt well, you can't be competitive. Instead, they see this electric delivery of Apollos, and they see that as a tool for the kingdom. And so all the more they want to take Apollos and teach him the truth. I love what they do. They pull him aside. They don't embarrass him publicly and say that's wrong. They don't try to show what they know and show everybody. They pull him aside. I imagine them bringing him to the house. Betty Leverance used to have me and a couple guys to the house with Keith and the food was amazing. It was easy to want to go over there. And I imagine uh, Priscilla and Aquila having him at their table and then unpacking the good news about Jesus and that the Holy Spirit has been given in Acts and, and Apollos just like soaking it in. And then if you're really good at building people, then you share them. So like you, you do the time, you hunt, and then you, you pull them aside and you invest a significant amount of time in them. If you're really good at it, then you open up your hands before the Lord and you go, where, where do you want to send this guy? So Paulus was really helpful at Ephesus, I, I imagine. But then as, if you continue to read, he's going to be sent out. He's going to go to Achaia. He's going to another area and he's going to share the gospel there because we're about way more than just what we want and the people we know. We share it in the process of building people. This, this young couple, maybe middle-aged couple at this point, Priscilla and Quilla, they're building churches. By building people, they're building churches, and that's what we're doing here at Radius. If you're new with us, man, we want to build churches, not buildings, not, not, not brick and mortar, but people that form the church that make a difference in this town. 
And let me just quit by uh, walking you through this timeline of this couple's life and, and have you examine your life with it. And I'll read you this passage from Romans. So we meet Priscilla and Aquila, uh, Aquila in Corinth. We don't know when they believe, perhaps before they're there. They meet Paul and they hang out with him for two plus years. They travel with him to a new place in Ephesus, in Ephesus and they build their home there. And in their home, they house the church. In Ephesus, they meet this guy named Apollos, and they train him. They build people there, right? Like they build him and others, and this church is established. Eventually, as some of you might think, uh, uh, Priscilla wants to go home, and they move back to Rome. And in Rome, they establish another church. They have a church in their home. Paul seems to be familiar with it. He writes to them in Rome, and in Rome, they establish this church, and eventually they're ejected from Rome again, this time because they're Christians. Nero burns uh, 80% of Rome <laughs> to cover his tracks. He blames it on the Christians. Perhaps Priscilla and Aquila's home is literally burned in the fire. We don't know. And they work their way back to Ephesus. Here's what Paul says to them in Romans, Romans 16. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I'm thankful to them. And so are all the Gentile churches. I also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. He acknowledges this church in their home. He acknowledges their good work for the churches, for all the Gentiles. But he has this crazy statement. Ladies, it's an awkward statement for me. They once risked their lives for me. It's really weird to think about Priscilla, particularly, risking her life to protect Paul. I don't know how that went down. But he names them together, and he says, as a couple, their life was laid on the line so that I could live, in essence. It's really what we're looking for here at Radius. Couples, singles, all of us. Uh, to take our time, like Priscilla and Aquila did, our gifts, and organize them accordingly, like Priscilla and Aquila did. Our resources, they seem to take their cash and put it in play for the kingdom. And eventually our life. Like, really lay our life on the line for the thing in this world that's most important, and that is the glory of Jesus Christ, exalting Jesus to the position that he belongs, and sharing the good news about Jesus with our radius. In the end, uh, we don't have this in the Bible, but many scholars believe that Priscilla and Aquila actually gave up their life, that in Ephesus they were martyred. They were killed for their faith, and they've blessed us all with their story. Man, I want to challenge you and me to go home and do a review tonight if you're married. And just ask the question about that home. How healthy is that home? Supposed to, if we're building it, is where is it right now? You can ask some of those questions that we've talked to, like, do we need to set aside some disciplined time where we're in the word together in a different way that we've been? Is this thing so shaky that we need to go talk to somebody? It's hidden. Nobody knows. It's so shaky that we need to get it in front of somebody else so that we can protect it from falling apart and hurting all involved. You could also ask the question, are we willing to share this thing, the bricks and mortar right here? If the Lord asked us to move to another part of town, would we? Would we let somebody live in this house? Would we host a small group in this house? Ask, ask some of those real questions for your family about whether you're tied in, not just to what we're doing here at Radius, but to this mission that's been going on for 2,000 years where the living God is taking good news to the people he loves. Let me pray for us all. I thank you for Cheryl right now, Lord. Thank you for making us a team 35 years ago. Recognize that we're vulnerable that uh, in so many ways, either one of us could fall into a season of deep selfishness and blow up what you put together. Protect us from that, Lord. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, deepen us with you. Make our home strong and good for the future. Pray that for the couples at Radius. I know some of them, Lord. Some of them are in trouble right now, and I pray you'd meet them in that trouble. You'd rescue them from the trouble where they're being selfish. Admonish them. 
discipline them, awaken them to that selfishness and save that marriage, Lord, as an example of how much you love the church, Jesus. We have lots of couples here that for years have served and really the reason Radius is here is because of their good work. Pray you give them the energy to work all the way to the end. Pray that their heads would be up, that they'd see somebody they could build and they take the opportunity to build them, Lord. I love the way Acts talks about all sorts of folks, Lord. So for folks in the room that are married, meet them today. Give them great hope of how you want to use them to uh, establish your kingdom. Let them feel your love today. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.